Hey everybody, Todd Wilkinson from the James River Basin Partnership out here on South Creek with Brent Stock. We've been asked by the city of Springfield to help out with the 50th anniversary birthday celebrations. Normally we'd be out on Lake Springfield or the James River conducting our annual Earth Day cleanup, but obviously due to the circumstances this year, we're not gonna be able to do that. So we've got the next best thing. Uh, we're gonna give you this afternoon a tour of the South Creek Restoration Project. We're gonna talk a little bit about why water quality is so important to Springfield and the Ozarks. We'll talk about how you can get involved in it, and we'll introduce you to concepts like what's your watershed address? And we'll also introduce you to the little river critters called macroinvertebrates that live here in the stream. But if you don't know who we are, just really quickly, the James River Basin Partnership is a watershed conservation nonprofit. We manage the James River Watershed or Basin, which stretches from Seymour in Webster County all the way down to Table Rock Lake. So almost a million acres there in the basin or the watershed, and they all drain to that central location, the James River and its tributaries like the Finley River and Crane Creek and Flat Creek. What do we do? Well, we have a wide variety of projects and programs that we do. We offer everything from rebates or septic pump outs. It's important to keep the groundwater clean. We offer rain barrel rebates, lawn steward soil testing programs. We work in conjunction with the city of Springfield and other area communities like Nixon Ozark to bring water quality education to local schools and to the general public. And we work with partner organizations like Ozark Greenways and the Watershed Committee of the Ozarks and Missouri Stream Teams to help in our mission to keep these urban streams and Ozark waterways clean and clear for future generations. We want our kids and our grandkids to look back and really be proud of all the work that we've done. And it's work that you can help out with too. Now we're here on Sunset Avenue where Sunset and Fort meet. That's an address, but we're also here in a watershed address as well. And if you're not familiar with that, Everybody lives in a watershed on Earth. There's, there's no one that, that, that doesn't have a watershed address. Our watershed address right now is South Creek, which flows down into Wilson's Creek. Wilson's Creek flows all the way down into the James, and then eventually the James flows into the White River, which was impounded back in the 1950s to make Table Rock Lake. So we have a reservoir. The White River flows all the way through northern Arkansas down to the Mississippi River, and that eventually goes out into the Gulf of Mexico. So the watershed address here in Springfield, what goes into that watershed can eventually end up in the Gulf of Mexico. That's why it's so important that we keep these streams clean, that we deal with runoff, stormwater runoff that comes off of lawns and farms and city streets, impervious surfaces like driveways and parking lots and roads. We wanna make sure that, that everything that's going into that watershed address is not gonna do any harm downstream. We all live downstream. So I'm going to turn it over to Brent, and he's going to talk a little bit about the restoration process. Now, it's going to be a little awkward at times. This isn't our day job, but be patient with us. All right, guys, I'm Brent Stock. I'm the director of the James River Basin Partnership. Um, today, like Todd mentioned, we're out at South Creek, and we're going to be talking about volunteer water quality monitoring efforts that we've undertaken um, through a couple different projects. So um, just a little background on South Creek. Uh, many of you guys uh, that have lived in Springfield for quite some time know that this was actually a popular stretch for fishing and recreation um, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, as Springfield began to grow, we uh, grew into a more impervious environment. So we have more roads, more sidewalks, more rooftops, more parking lots, areas that don't allow water to infiltrate into the soil like it would in a more natural environment. Through that, we have to create stormwater infrastructure that allows us to send that water downstream so that we don't have flooding going on in our communities. So South Creek was a receiving body of water um, and over time and through development began to receive more water. So we encountered some flooding issues. Back in the mid 80s, uh, the city of Springfield actually put the channel of South Creek about a mile stretch in a concrete channel. Um, many of you guys that have lived here for a long time probably saw the construction of that channel and then in 2015 probably actually saw that channel being torn out and now you may think like why why would we spend that money to later tear it up right well as the city grows um, we increase the amount of storm water that ends up in our urban streams and we also grow in our understanding of how we should manage that water for both uh, human use and human safety but also for ecological purposes so obviously our water sources are very important for local wildlife um, obviously the things living within the stream things like fish uh, crayfish 
We have uh, aquatic birds and uh, mammals that utilize the stream. And then of course, everything downstream that drinks from it, it's obviously important to protect it for those reasons. But we also need to protect it for other reasons, things that we don't normally think of. Um, today, we're gonna talk about macroinvertebrates. Um, that's something that we've been focusing on in South Creek for a number of years now, starting in about 2014, 2015. Um, so back, back in uh, 2014, 2015, we partnered with the city of Springfield to um, study the, the water quality within South Creek through volunteer water quality monitoring efforts. Um, basically, that involves collecting the macroinvertebrates that live within the stream, inventorying them, and giving the stream a score based on the richness and diversity of the critters that we found within the stream. Those macroinvertebrates make up the basis of the aquatic food chain, and they kind of work as a canary in the coal mine that tell us about local water quality. So I've tossed around that term macroinvertebrate. It's kind of a big word. Some of you may not know what it means. Uh, if we break it down into two parts, macro and invertebrate, macro means that it's big enough to be seen with the naked eye. We don't need any special equipment like microscopes or magnifying glasses to see those critters. Invertebrate, many of you guys know this term, means that it lacks a backbone. So we have something that's big enough to be seen with the naked eye and lacks a backbone. We're looking for things like mayflies, uh, crane flies, damsel flies, uh, midges, leeches, crayfish, all kinds of stuff that you see within a stream. If any of you guys are fly fishermen, you've probably heard those words referenced quite a bit. Um, whenever you're fly fishing, you want to try to match the hatch. So you try to create flies that imitate uh, larvae of those critters or the adult forms. Many times these macroinvertebrates grow up underwater, living amongst the stream bottom and then hatch and make their way to the surface and then for the rest of their life live as a uh, terrestrial insect. So that's a really unique process to kind of go through a transformation similar to what a butterfly would go through. So we're going to collect those macroinvertebrates today, talk about the importance, uh, the important role that they play in local water quality and how we use them to judge local water quality based on the Missouri Stream Team's volunteer water quality monitoring standards. Now, Missouri Stream Teams is probably something that many of you guys are familiar with. If you're not, it's basically a state-run organization that works to protect the state's streams, not just urban streams, also the rural streams, the small creeks, the big bodies of water like the Mississippi and the Missouri. Um, it's working to protect all the state's waters through volunteer efforts. So whether that's through volunteer water quality monitoring or litter cleanups or uh, tra planting trees along a riparian area, all those efforts um, go towards improving and protecting local water quality and there are things that are promoted by Missouri Stream Teams. So if you're looking to get involved in those programs, just take a look at it online. Missouri Stream Teams is easy to find. If you're interested in what we're doing today, just look for volunteer water quality monitoring. They have classes that open up twice per year for the intro classes um, and then they have several levels above that um, where you can uh, get more certifications and move up to things like chemical monitoring um, and monitoring chlorides and all kinds of stuff. But today we're going to talk about just kind of the basics, uh, macroinvertebrate monitoring, we're going to demonstrate kick netting, and we're going to demonstrate the uh, identification and inventorying process. So I'm going to invite Todd back into the stream with me. Um, we're going to talk about kick netting, and we're, first we're going to talk about the equipment that we use and the areas that we kick net in. So you'll notice that right now we're standing in a riffle. Um, a riffle is an area of shallow water that's heavily oxygenated. Um, those small little critters, they need that oxygen to survive. And um, a riffle provides that oxygen by having broken water that travels over boulders and cobble and gravel and through vegetation, um, breaks that water up and provides oxygen to the stream. Very important features. Um, they're easily, easy sampled um, because they're not too deep and they contain a whole host of different macroinvertebrates. The other parts of a stream include areas like pools. Pools are the deeper parts of a stream. Um, many of you guys, if you've ever uh, swam in a creek, you've probably swam in a pool. Um, that's where some of your bigger game fish um, and minnows and things like that hang out. Um, it's an easier area for them to take cover. It's deeper water. Um, and then they can swim up into the shallower water and take advantage of the crayfish and macroinvertebrates that hang out in those areas. The in-between areas are kind of uh, what we call runs. So a run isn't quite as deep as a pool. Um, it's not super shallow and oxygenated like a riffle may be. Um, it's kind of that intermediate water. It's a little too deep for us to sample in, so we mostly rely on riffles and areas of vegetation. So in this riffle, uh, we've got several different types of structures that these macroinvertebrates live amongst. The first thing that we have is gravel. Most of our Ozark streams are 
uh, characterized by lots of gravel. Um, the bigger rocks that we see within the stream, um, something about this size would be what we call cobble. Um, cobble's not quite a boulder, and it's a little bit too big to be classified as, as gravel. It's the intermediate size. The next big thing we see in the stream is going to be what we call a boulder. Uh, most of you guys know what a boulder is, but really anything bigger than a softball is what we're going to consider. Oh, there's a red winged blackbird right there. <laughs> it's got photo bombs. Yeah. Um, anything bigger than a softball is going to be what we call a boulder for this exercise. So ideally, you want to find an area that has all three of those different types of structure. If you find aquatic vegetation like the bulrushes and grasses that we see growing along the edge of the stream, that's, a, that's bonus areas. Um, most of these critters are going to be living in about that uh, six inches of gravel and rock that lie on the bottom of the stream. They're going to be hanging out amongst that substrate, avoiding predators, um, finding a good place to wait it out until their uh, more adult days when they can hatch and fly off. Um, again, some of them do live within the stream throughout the rest of their lives. So in order to collect these guys, we use what we call uh, a process called kick netting. So we use this net, it looks similar to a window screen, and it's uh, pervious, so it's gonna allow the water to pass through, but the uh, little windows in the net are so fine that the bugs can't pass through as well. Now, when I say bugs, I'm just simply referring back to macroinvertebrates. It's just a little bit easier for me to communicate by just saying bugs all the time. Um, so we're gonna place this net in an area of high flow on our riffle. So we've identified an area along this bank, um, right next to this willow tree. Um, this area is again, it's important because it's got high flow, we've got a bank to kind of block that flow and channelize that water into the net, and we've got a good amount of cobble, gravel, and boulders, and vegetation along the bank. So the first thing we're going to do, Todd's going to place the net, the next thing we're going to do is hold that black uh, strip down in order to uh, secure the net to the bottom so we're not losing any macroinvertebrates out the bottom of the, the net. So I'm going to walk over here. Hopefully I'll stay in the camera the whole time. <laughs> so the first part of the process again is going to be securing the net to the bottom. Brent's just going to pick up some cobble and some boulders and he's going to place those on the bottom of the net, the lip there, the black lip. All right. So I'm going to look for one more rock here. Now that we've got the net fairly secure, we're going to move back about the same distance um, back as the net is tall. So the net's about three and a half, four feet tall. We're going to move back about that same amount. And I'm going to work my way forward towards the net. In doing so, I'm going to make sure to kick up the substrate and I want to make mud. If I'm not making mud, I'm not kicking deep enough. So we're going to make sure we've got good flow into the net. We've already got some minnows in there actually. Crawfish. And crawfish. We're actually going to pick this side up a little more. Okay. So I'm going to push that water towards the net. And I'm going to use my feet. And again, we kind of call this the benthic boogie because it looks like we're dancing out in the stream. So I'm going to kick that water up. I'm making mud, so I'm getting down deep enough. Okay. Now I'm trying to move those boulders and cobble with my feet. Again, I'll pick some up at times and uh, there's some moss on some of these rocks. I'm going to go ahead and wipe that off in the stream. Just try to dislodge any of the macroinvertebrates that could be hanging out on them. Set that off to the side. So again, I'm trying to get my feet down to about four to six inches below the surface of that substrate. I'm going to kick over here, try to dislodge anything from the uh, vegetation along the side of the stream wash off some of these rocks in the flowing water. Now obviously you need to be careful when you're doing something like this. Um, snakes are out. That's probably the biggest danger. Um, none of these macroinvertebrates can hurt you too bad. Some of the crayfish can pinch you if they're bigger. Um, and some of the helgramites, for instance, they can bite pretty hard. But for the most part, everything we're going to see today is pretty harmless. So, Making my way to the edge of the, the net, being careful not to kick the net. All right, now's the important part. We have to make sure that we get all the bugs from the net to the shore so we can inventory them. First things first, I'm going to take the rocks that we used to secure the net, and I'm going to wash those off so we dislodge anything that was holding on tight to the, the rocks. Right. 
Last thing we're going to do is make sure to pick up the net well from the bottom so that nothing falls out of the bottom when we pick it up. Ready, Todd? Ready. Okay. Todd's going to take the net over to the shore. Um, we're going to get everything situated and we're going to show you what the net looks like after we collect the bugs. We've actually pre-kicked a stretch of this stream so that we can find some bugs to show you guys to speed up the process. Normally whenever we're sampling, we spend a minimum of 10 minutes picking through the net to make sure that we got all the bugs. Um, some of the little critters, they don't like to move until they've dried out quite a bit. Um, things like riffle beetles are notorious for kind of hanging out and lingering. So it's important to wait a minimum of 10 minutes before you decide to call it on the net. Um, and again, we're trying to find different types of macroinvertebrates. Um, the greater the richness and diversity, the better the water quality of the stream. Um, there's three different categories that we classify these things in. Uh, the first one being sensitive. Sensitive macroinvertebrates can only be found in the most clean, pristine, cool, uh, well oxygenated waters. The uh, second level down is somewhat sensitive. Those guys like crawfish, for instance, um, they can live in water that's slightly polluted, um, but they can also live in some of the cleanest streams out there. Um, and then finally, the last uh, category that we have are uh, tolerant species. So things like leeches, aquatic worms, and midges, those guys can live in some of the most polluted waters on our planet. Um, ideally, what we want to find is a high number of highly sensitive uh, macroinvertebrates. Things like uh, mayflies, like helgramites, stoneflies, those guys are great water quality indicators and we know they wouldn't be present unless they were in some really clean, pristine water. Um, ideally, we want to find a mix of the highly, highly sensitive, somewhat tolerant and tolerant species going kind of showing that full range across the board is a good thing just because we're finding tolerant species doesn't mean we have bad water quality because we found those highly sensitive species so we're going to take a look at the net show you what that looks like after we kick through it and then we're going to show you some of the macroinvertebrates that we've pulled from previous net sets so todd's going to focus on the net that we have down there and then i'm going to take a look at the macros that we collected before okay so we're going to switch our action over here. So this is what our net looks like after we've kick netted. Um, again, you can see quite a bit of uh, little sandy gravel that's made its way into the net. Um, lots of mud, some vegetation. We've even got a piece of cobble that made its way in. Um, as we pulled the net out of the water, we noticed a few minnows in there. That's the first thing that we usually return to the water. We try to wet our hands, collect those minnows, and get them back into the stream as quick as possible um, in order for them to survive. Um, then we can move on to the other critters, things like crayfish. Crayfish are uh, known to crawl out of your ice cube trays. This is what we use to inventory, inventory the critters. Since they don't like to stay put, we get them back into the stream as quick as possible. Um, then we start collecting our species, our, our different macroinvertebrate species that are out there. Uh, again, we pick for a minimum of 10 minutes typically, but today we sped up the process so that we don't bore you guys. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you some of the macros that we've got that we collected in previous net sets. One of the first things that I'll show you is a crayfish. Many of you guys have seen these guys. Missouri is home to an abundance of crayfish species. Some will live in prairie environments. Some only live in the upper White River Basin, um, which the James River is a part of. Um, so we have some that are endemic to the state of Missouri and can't be found anywhere else. So that's pretty neat. Um, this is one of the common varieties of crayfish that we find. Um, We'll see them as small as, uh, a little smaller than that guy to about the size of a nickel, all the way up to the three or four inch size crayfish. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and return him to the stream. He's dying to get back in there. So let him go. After that, most of what we found is pretty small. Um, some of the bigger uh, things that we've found are things like the mayflies, which I'm gonna do my best to try to show you guys. It's really hard to do on camera. But mayflies, and if you can't see it well, you can Google it. Um, there are several different species out there more than several quite a few actually um, but they're pretty easy to spot they've got gills that flutter around on their abdomen um, they've got uh, several sets of legs and then uh, they kind of have a distinct tail feature um, there's different types of mayflies that we find in south creek um, we'll find them uh, small enough that you can fit three or four of them on your pinky nail and big enough that uh, they could take up about um, you know a good portion of your your, your little finger so um, a wide range of sizes we also find things like damselflies um, right there we've got a good example again come in variety of different sizes 
We have some uh, caddis flies in here as well. They're not easily seen on camera, so I apologize for that. We also typically find riffle beetles. Um, we've got some aquatic worms. Uh, what else do we have in here? We've uh, got some planaria. Those actually don't go towards our score, but it's good, just good to see another species out there. We find leeches. Occasionally we find water pennies. Uh, we find quite a few scuds typically. Um, cranefly larvae, dragonfly larvae. Um, what else? Quite a few different species out there, different uh, varieties of aquatic snails. We even find some invasive Asiatic clams as well. So that's not a great thing to see, um, but that's just another uh, macro. It's a bivalve that's going to survive in the stream that wouldn't be there if it was heavily polluted. So while it may not be preferred to see in our streams, um, at least it can tell us a little bit about water quality. So we're going to go ahead and let these guys go back into the stream. I'm going to turn it back over to Todd so that he can uh, finish up, tell you a little bit about what we've got going on. And then, uh, again, we just hope that you guys have a chance to get out on Earth Day and enjoy the great outdoors. Hopefully you get out and find some time to spend on a stream. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back around here. So like Brent said, why, does, why do we do all of this? Well, because all of us at James River based in partnership, and it's not just Brent and I. We have uh, two other staff members, Tim Smith and Loring Bullard, longtime members of the Water Warrior community. They're involved. We've got membership. We've got a lot of folks that are members of JRBP that are involved and volunteers. As Brent mentioned earlier, JRBP is part of Missouri Stream Team. We have our own stream team. A lot of our friends and partners are members of Stream Team as well. So when we're not out doing water quality monitoring, we're doing litter cleanups. And I talked about the Earth Day litter cleanup that we unfortunately had to cancel this year. Hopefully we'll be back out on that in 2021. We're also hoping that our June River rescue will, will happen this year. But if it doesn't, we'll be back out again in 2021. And in the meantime, we really encourage all of you, get involved with Missouri Stream Teams. You can Google them, you can look at their website. They've got all sorts of information, everything from macro invertebrates to the importance of karst topography the cave systems in Missouri, the sinkholes that we all know, and how that affects our groundwater. Groundwater and surface water are connected here in the Ozarks. You can get involved in Missouri stream teams and help pick up a local stream or creek on your property, something like South Creek, something like Galloway Creek over in Sequiota. There's a lot of different opportunities out there, and Missouri stream teams is citizen science in action. It provides equipment like kick netting and stream team bags, trash bags to you free can sign up as a volunteer and get this material and go out. So what we're hoping that you'll do on Earth Day, get out, get along, uh, get out the, along the streams, out in the parks, along our beautiful Greenway trails, enjoy them, be safe. Obviously we want you to, uh, to make sure that you're doing physical distance, that you're staying safe, but get out there, enjoy this beautiful weather, enjoy that sunshine, and then also help the community. Bring along a trash bag. It doesn't have to be a fancy trash bag like this. By the way, all of this trash is material that we just picked up while we were setting up to make this video. So we've done our part. We're going to take this with us. You can fill up a trash bag while you and your family are out walking along a Greenway Trail or a park, and then take that, throw that in a dumpster, and you've done your part. If we all do that little bit, we're going to make a great big difference. And right now, that's what a lot of people are thinking about. How can we play our part? How can we help out? Well, obviously we want to make sure that the good earth is clean and free of trash and debris because remember as i said with the watershed address all of that is going downstream we don't want that to go down into the james down into the white river and eventually into the gulf of mexico we want to keep those clean and free for us to enjoy brent also mentioned our website check us out on our website jamesriverbasin.com we're on facebook we're also on instagram we'd love us if you followed us liked us sign up for our e-newsletter. Once we're back up in normal operations, we'll be doing some of our soil uh, monitoring or soil testing, and we are offering our rebate programs on septic tank pump outs and also on rain barrel rebates. Uh, we'd love to have you as a member or come out and help as a volunteer. Our Facebook page and our website has a calendar of events. We'll see what happens throughout the rest of this year, but follow us. We share a lot of different stories on our Facebook pages. We talk about some of the things that our partner organizations and City of Springfield and Ozark and Nixon and Republic are doing to keep the water quality uh, uh, clean and clear here in the Ozarks. But we'd love to have you partner with us. You guys make up the James River Basin Partnership. We want to make sure that uh, we're all doing our part during this time, and we want to see you on the we want to see you on the river. 
So guys, thank you again to all of our members, volunteers, and just general enthusiasts of our local streams. We hope to see you out there this summer. Right now, we hope to see you six feet away. But uh, again, take some time to get out on the water. Make sure that you're following local laws and regulations pertaining to the COVID-19 crisis. But get out there, get outside, take care of our natural resources, and just stay connected through all this. It's important to maintain that community, and we have such a strong water quality community here in Southwest Missouri, and we're thankful that you're a part of it. Thank you guys for tuning in today. We appreciate it, and uh, happy Earth Day. Let us know if you have any questions in the comments below. Thanks.